His first book, Torchbearers of Democracy, African American Soldiers in World War I, was published, it was published in 2010 by the University of North Carolina Press. Uh, widely praised as a landmark study, Torchbearer of Democracy won the 2011 Liberty Legacy Foundation Award from the Organization of American Historians. And he won, uh, the book won a lot of other prizes, the 2011 Distinguished Book Award from the Society for Military History, and designation as a 2011 Choice Outstanding Academic Title. He is co-editor of Charleston Syllabus, Real Race, Racism and Racial Violence, published by Georgia Press, University of Georgia Press and the Major Problems in Amer uh, African American History. Second edition came out in 2016. Chad has published articles and books reviews in numerous leading journals and collections. He has earned fellowships from the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Staff Studies at Harvard University, the American Council of Learned Society, the Schoenberg Center for Research in Black Culture, the Ford Foundation and the Woodrow Wilson Foundation. He's currently completing a study on Du Bois and World War I, or Du Bois in World War I. Du Bois. Du Bois, you know, you're on the front. Um, the sponsors <laughs> of this event, and I didn't introduce myself because I recognize faces here, so you know who I am. <laughs> uh, the sponsors are the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding, the Leslie Center for the Humanities, the Political Economy Project, the Department of Government, the Department of Russian, the Department of History, and the Department of Film and Media Studies. So let, help me well to welcome Chad Williams here. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Graziella, I have to make sure my, the R's roll off the tongue. Graziella? Yeah, how am I doing? Okay. Uh, thank you so much for, ooh, is the microphone? You know, I don't know if I need the microphone. It works for the recording. It works for the recording. Okay, so we're going to go with the microphone. Um, but, I mean, since we're a, a small group here, um, I think it would be most conducive to just kind of have a conversation, right? I mean, so I got a whole lecture here. I'll refer to it. Um, but I, I want us to, to kind of talk this through and to, to really think about what the significance of World War I is, the significance of African American participation uh, in World War I. All right, so before I get into that, again, thank you, Garziel, for your incredibly generous uh, invitation. I'm glad that we were able to work out the date uh, to be here. I know we were doing a little uh, calendar hopping here and there. Uh, everybody at the, the Leslie Center for the Humanities, and of course, all of you for, for being here uh, this afternoon. Uh, so we are in the midst of the centennial of World War I, just in case you didn't know that. Uh, and I've been thinking quite a bit uh, about World War I, uh, obviously. Uh, I figure that since I'm not gonna be around for the next centennial, I might as well try and milk this for, for all that I can. Uh, but really thinking about just what World War I meant for the world, obviously, but specifically for the United States. And why is it that, particularly on this side of the Atlantic, World War I doesn't register in the popular memory? Why it doesn't have the same type of resonance as the Civil War? Why it doesn't have the same type of resonance as World War II? Even Vietnam, for that matter. Ken Burns just had a very much ballyhooed documentary, um, received a lot of attention. Why does World War I kind of seem to recede uh, in uh, the collective history, the collective memory, uh, when we think about wars in American history? Also, what changes did World War I bring about? What are its legacies? And obviously, for the specific purposes of my research, what did the war mean for African Americans, and what did it mean for other peoples of African descent? I'm currently working on a new book on W.B. Du Bois and World War I. So I have Du Bois on the brain. Mm -hmm. Forgive me. But he was very important. He thought about the same questions that I just posed, the significance of World War I, 
for peoples of African descent, but also what it meant for the larger black world. Du Bois, father of the modern civil rights movement, arguably the greatest black intellectual this country has produced, spent literally decades grappling and wrestling with both the history and memory of World War I for African Americans and other peoples of African descent. He lived through the war. It was a very traumatic experience for him in many respects, uh, but it was also a defining experience, a defining moment in terms of his political and intellectual uh, development and kind of the larger trajectory of his uh, social and political thought. We would have spent decades grappling with what the war meant. Uh, and we can talk later about the next project that I'm working on. It's, it's actually pretty interesting. Um, we have but, a oh, class here during the summer teaching a course on Du Bois. Oh, really? OK, Cornell West, that's, that's my guy. When I was in graduate school, I was a TA for Cornell West yeah. at Princeton. Um, it was this amazing course he did. And I, and I was convinced he wasn't going to be able to pull it off. It was on the historical, literary, and philosophic dimensions of Du Bois, Toni Morrison, and James Baldwin. So I'm like, how are you going to talk about all of them in one semester? And have that make, and he did it. He did it. So yes, I'm, I'm always eternally indebted to, to Cornell West. Um, and indebted to, to Du Bois, because in some ways, my project, my first book, um, go back to the first book uh, for a little bit, kind of owes its title to Du Bois. So when I was in graduate school, I was doing research for my dissertation, which would become my first book. And I was looking through the Du Bois papers at the University of Massachusetts uh, Amherst and came across a letter. And it was a letter that an African-American man had written to Du Bois. And he was talking about black soldiers uh, serving in the war, this group of black soldiers specifically from Chicago. And one guy in particular, and he used this phrase. He described black soldiers as torchbearers to make the world safe for democracy. Torch bearers to make the world safe for democracy. So I saw this, and I'm like, wow, that's a great title for my dissertation. <laughs> that was the first thing that popped into my mind. Right? Um, and it became the title uh, of my book. But then as I was working on the dissertation and ultimately really working on the book, I had to think about what that phrase meant, what it meant to actually describe African Americans and African American soldiers specifically as torchbearers of democracy. And this made me think about the very meaning of democracy itself. Right, what did democracy mean for African Americans during World War I? Right, why was this such a powerful, evocative phrase, right, taken directly from what Joe Wilson's speech, April the 2nd, 1917, when he threw the United States into the war. Why did this phrase, to make the world safe for democracy, resonate on so many levels, not just for African Americans, but for oppressed peoples all over the world? I had to go back to the very meaning of democracy uh, itself. So kind of the thrust of what I'd like for us to, to think about is kind of this idea of, of democracy, right? how it relates to the experiences of African Americans uh, during World War I, but also in thinking about the meaning of democracy today, 100 years later, after World War I. What does democracy mean in our current moment? How can we take the lessons from World War I and apply them to our current moment in thinking about how democracy is still incredibly fraught and how race stands at the center of our current debates, to put it lightly, over the very meaning of democracy. So as I said, Woodrow Wilson famously proclaimed that the United States was entering the war to make the world safe for democracy. Right? And as we know, democracy in this country's history has always been a work in progress. But World War I demonstrated that it was something that African Americans were willing to fight for, that it had a history a fraught history, but one, nevertheless, that African American state claimed to and insisted upon making real 
right? transforming democracy into an everyday experience right? and making it relevant to their everyday experiences. And black soldiers embodied that. Black soldiers during the war and after were the embodiments of this larger struggle for democracy that African Americans engaged in during the World War I era. Some 380,000 African American soldiers served in World War I, both as combatants and as laborers. Over 200,000 served overseas in France, right? Trick as you well know. They served in multiple uh, capacities. They, as I said, both kind of physically and symbolically shaped what would become the New Negro Movement. And we can get into that uh, a little bit later. Their experiences and what they represented, I believe, allow us to develop a deeper understanding of how the war socially, culturally, politically, intellectually shaped the World War I era more broadly. And W.B. Du Bois certainly knew this. So the history of black soldiers providing us, as I said, with a powerful example of how African Americans a century later continue to fight for democracy in the United States. So one of the questions that historians continue to wrestle with today, what was World War I about? How did it start? What were the origins of the war? So I'll go back to Du Bois, who had his own particular interpretation of what World War I was about and why it started. This maelstrom that would ultimately lead to over 17 million deaths. Du Bois made the explicit connection between the war and the larger African diaspora. Specifically, he rooted the origins of the war in the desire for colonial territories and the exploitation of human resources in Africa, in Asia, and other parts of the black world. All right, saw empire, European empire, and the tensions, the, the competition between the different European superpowers for colonial territories and uh, economic um, exploitation of uh, peoples of African descent specifically as ultimately leading to the origins of the war. As he said in a famous 1915 uh, article of African Roots of War, yet in a very real sense, Africa is a prime cause of this terrible overturning of civilization which we have lived to see. He also said in another editorial a year earlier, as a matter of fact, that supposing that the present war is far removed from the color problem of America would be wrong. He said specifically that the wild quest for imperial expansion among the colored races between rival European nations and, in his words, the theory of the inferiority of the darker peoples right, was at the uh, root causes of how the war started. And he could point to the example of the use of African soldiers and laborers by the different warring countries, specifically the French made use of uh, West and North African soldiers uh, extensively uh, along the Western Front. This is an image of the two Senegalese, uh, the West African uh, soldiers who were used uh, largely as uh, shock troops, kind of thrown in uh, to uh, battle without proper arms. Um, we can certainly get into a conversation about French racial attitudes, kind of the myth of French colorblindness uh, and how the experiences of African soldiers really pushes back uh, against that. Uh, but this is also a very important example of how the war was a truly world war. And it was a war that affected peoples of African descent throughout the diaspora. Right? Du Bois was editor of The Crisis, the NAACP's magazine. And The Crisis ran photographs of different African soldiers right, serving in the war. So this kind of development of a larger diasporic consciousness right, amongst African Americans was a very important part of uh, the war's context, even before the United States enters. So while Du Bois understood this kind of larger global diasporic uh, dimensions uh, to the war, he also realized that the role of African Americans 
in the war was going to be central. But before I get into that, I think it's important to remember the context and the state of American democracy on the eve of the war. To remember just how far removed African Americans were from democracy, right? In terms of Jim Crow segregation, disenfranchisement, denial of the right to vote, certainly throughout the South, debt peonage, sharecropping, convict lease system, horrific racial violence. This was the reality of black life on the eve of American entry into the war and shaped how African Americans thought about the war and their potential place in it. Right, these were the realities that they were concerned with. Right, so they saw the war as something that was distant in many respects from the everyday concerns of their lives. It right, doesn't mean that they weren't aware of what was happening. Right, but matters of everyday survival ultimately were paramount. Another important part of that context is the Great Migration. Right, the migration of over 500,000 African Americans from the South uh, to the North during the years um, of the war caused by uh, the decline in European immigration uh, as a result of the war, opportunity uh, for jobs, but more importantly, opportunity for freedom. African Americans leaving the South and going North. All right, so the war, even before the United States enters, you know, it's certainly affecting African Americans in many ways. Right? But their concerns, for the most part, right, are very specific. Right? Thinking about the specific uh, social, political, and economic concerns of black life uh, in Jim Crow uh, America. As Rayford Logan, himself South American historian, noted this was kind of the nadir, one of the lowest points uh, in uh, race relations uh, in modern American history. But with that being said, democracy was still something that African Americans strived for, something that continued to resonate. And that's why Woodrow Wilson probably should have thought a little bit more carefully about his words that he used on April the 2nd, 1917, when he threw the United States into World War I. I don't like Woodrow Wilson. All right, so that's the last picture you're going to see of Woodrow Wilson. Um, <laughs> and we can certainly get into a long discussion about Woodrow Wilson. But as I said at the beginning of my remarks, there was something about the phrasing, something about how he chose to frame American entry into the war. Right, when he stood before Congress on April the 2nd, 1917, and said that the United States is entering the war not for any territorial gain, I didn't have any selfish purposes that the United States was entering the war to make the world safe for democracy, that we are one of the champions of mankind. All right? And you, I mean, just all kinds of eye rolls. <laughs> um, and that's actually the response that most African Americans had at the time as well. Like, really? We're going to enter this war to make the world safe for democracy? Right? How will we make Georgia safe for the Negro, first of all? Right? So African Americans very quickly picked up on how hypocritical Woodrow Wilson was and the United States as a whole, right, in terms of espousing these democratic ideals and positioning itself as the exemplar of democracy, right, when democracy was being denied to American citizens at home. Right? But they were able to appropriate that at the same time right, and use Woodrow Wilson's words as a weapon right, to make the claim that if we enter this war, it is going to be to make America safe for democracy. So this very quickly became a war about African Americans being seen and treated as true American citizens. Events quickly borne out the hypocrisy of Woodrow Wilson's phrasing to make the world safe for democracy. The East St. Louis riot, July of 1917. A pogrom 
one of many pogroms in the World War I era. African Americans migrated to East St. Louis, attracted by employment opportunities, aluminum factories. July 2nd, 1917, white mobs intent on purging African Americans uh, from the city, burned, shot, stabbed, lynched, probably hundreds of people. Burned the entire African American neighborhood to the ground for 5,000 African Americans became refugees. It was horrific. Right? And cartoons like this ran in African American newspapers across the country. The tensions that the war produced in African American thought were profound. And Du Bois really exemplified this. If any of you have read Souls of Black Folk, hopefully you have. I always say to my students, I'm not going to let you graduate until you've read Souls of Black Folk. I'm going to pull you off the stage and knock you across the head with it. He talks about the two warring ideals right, of being black and being American. Our double consciousness right, of being American and being a Negro. Right? It's two unreconciled strivings whose dogged strength alone keeps them from being torn asunder. Can you be black and can you be American? Du Bois saw the war and other African Americans saw the war as an opportunity to reconcile that tension. Right? This was a very politically charged moment right? in terms of these larger questions about African American identity. Right? Um, and this was really exemplified in probably one of the most controversial editorials that he wrote in his career, Closed Ranks, where he says, makes the decision to kind of throw his weight behind the American war effort. And more than that, right? we of the colored race have no ordinary interest in the outcome. That which the German power represents today spells death to the aspirations of Negroes and all darker races for equality, freedom, and democracy. Let us not hesitate. Let us, while this war lasts, forget our special grievances and close our ranks with our own white fellow citizens and the allied nations that are fighting for democracy. We make no ordinary sacrifice, but we make it gladly and willingly with our eyes lifted to the hills. Now, there's a whole backstory behind this, this editorial. But I think the words are important to focus on. Because they speak to, as I said, this tension that existed amongst African Americans about just how should we articulate our Americanness? And how do we articulate our sense of loyalty and patriotism? Can we simultaneously express our loyalty to our country and also articulate and express our loyalty to our race. One of the reasons Du Bois received so much criticism for this editorial was because he suggested that a choice had to be made, right? that you had to place country before race. And many African Americans, most African Americans, refused to do that. They were not prepared to forget their special grievances, right? those disturbing slides that I showed before. But these were the type of debates that were happening in barbershops, in black newspapers, on street corners. Right? These were the type of tensions that World War I unleashed uh, within African American communities all over the country. And this is in part why African American soldiers were so important. Because African Americans knew that democracy would have to be fought for and that black people ultimately would need to place their lives on the line. So thinking about the history of black military service kind of as this highest form of patriotism and civic obligation, and what role African American soldiers would play in the war dominated both public and private discussions about black participation in the war effort. The memory, the history of black military service was incredibly important. African Americans thought about 
of the long history of black military participation, going back to the American Revolution, right? Crispus Attucks, black soldiers in uh, some of the earliest conflicts in this country's history, certainly harking back to the Civil War, right? Making the connection between black military service and transformations in the social, political status of black people, right? How war presented the opportunity for democracy to expand for black people. At the same time, black military service and the symbolism of black soldiers was also very threatening, especially to white Americans in the South. How black soldiers were seen as a direct threat to a racial hierarchy in which black people, and black men specifically, were supposed to remain subservient and under control. So that was why this incident was so important. Really the worst nightmares of Southern whites came true on the night of August the 24th, 1917 in Houston, Texas. After enduring weeks of racial abuse, hostility from white Houstonians, specifically white Houston Police Department, black soldiers of the 24th Infantry, and these were a collection of famous Buffalo soldiers, right? But a long history uh, of service, and going back to the end of the Civil War, they were stationed on the outskirts of Houston, uh, Camp Logan, overseeing construction of the camp. As I said, after enduring weeks of abuse, they snapped, fearing, some feared uh, that a mob was going to attack uh, the camp. Two soldiers from the battalion had been assaulted by Houston police earlier uh, that afternoon. They took up arms, deserted camp, and marched into the city and shot up the town. And 17 people, uh, soldiers, civilians uh, were killed, 15 white people, including four police officers. Uh, as I said, this was kind of the worst nightmare of white Southerners, black soldiers taking up arms and enacting violent retribution against white Southerners. Military officials uh, promptly placed the entire battalion, uh, 118 men, uh, under arrest, uh, tried them in three separate uh, court martials. After the first court martial, 13 soldiers were found uh, uh, guilty. Uh, and uh, executed without any due process. Uh, ultimately, uh, 19 soldiers uh, were killed, buried in unmarked graves. So we have these kind of competing ideas of what black military service meant. Right? And this is just in August of 1917. The United States hadn't even sent any combat soldiers over to France yet. Right? So America, in some ways, is at war even before arriving in France. So these questions are swirling throughout the country, just what is the future of black soldiers in the military? In what capacity are they going to serve? Should they serve at all? And certainly white Southerners didn't want them in the South, didn't want them training in the South. There are questions if they would even be allowed to carry guns, serve as combatants. Would they even be allowed to be drafted? The War Department, recognizing that excluding African Americans from service altogether uh, would be incredibly complicated uh, and politically dangerous, uh, decided to proceed with the inclusion of African Americans into the selective service um, uh, system, uh, which uh, began uh, in May 1917. So African Americans were included into the draft. But this did not mean that they would serve equally. Uh, it certainly didn't mean that they were going to be treated equally. Uh, from the onset of the draft, the War Department made the decision that the vast majority of African Americans would serve in a labor capacity, that they would man shovels instead of rifles. Right? And this reflected a belief amongst military officials that it was in the natural 
it was the natural capabilities of black men to serve in this capacity. Right? So the vast majority of black soldiers who were drafted coming from the South, the War Department felt that it was in their best interest and in the best interest of the Army to serve, um, to have them serve as laborers. Uh, one military official described them explicitly as laborers in uniform. Right? So uh, of the 200,000 African Americans who served overseas in France, uh, roughly 140,000 served in labor capacities, services of supplies, uh, other labor uh, units and battalions, loading and unloading ships, digging ditches, burying dead bodies, doing all the ugly work of the war. But for those of us who study war, know that this was essential to the war effort. All right, so they played a very important role in the success of the American Expeditionary Forces, but it also strained how these soldiers thought of themselves, right? Were they truly soldiers? What did it mean to be a laborer when you wanted to fight for your country? Uh, so the use of African Americans uh, as laborers reflected uh, certainly the institutionalized racism within uh, the military and uh, kind of the challenges that black soldiers um, had to endure in terms of the, the duties that were placed upon them. But not all soldiers, not all black soldiers served in this capacity. Uh, there were two black combat divisions, uh, the 92nd and 93rd divisions. The 92nd division was composed uh, almost exclusively of draftees. Uh, what made the 92nd division so significant, and this was in part born out of political pressure. Right? As I said, the military envisioned using the majority of black draftees as laborers, uh, black uh, civil rights leaders, uh, the black press, really pressured the War Department right, to create a division uh, of black combatants, of black soldiers. Right? We're insistent that black people needed to have the opportunity to die on the battlefield in order to demonstrate their Americanness, in order to demonstrate uh, their citizenship. So the 92nd Division was in some ways a product of this burgeoning civil rights movement right, that is an important part of the World War I era. What is especially important about the 92nd Division is that it contained black officers. Right? And the symbolism of the black officer was also incredibly important. Right? Again, the fears that many white Southerners and white people more broadly had of black soldiers had to do with this inversion of the racial hierarchy right? and the power that black soldiers had and black officers really symbolized the most kind of potent threat in that regard, right? with the power to be in command and to issue orders to white soldiers. Right? So this complete inversion of the racial hierarchy. Right? Uh, but uh, again, because of pressure by civil rights uh, groups like the NAACP, uh, an officer's training camp was created in Des Moines, Iowa. Right? And, uh, over uh, 1,200 uh, black officers ultimately received uh, commissions, most of them serving in the 92nd Division. The 92nd Division became one of the most controversial divisions in the entire uh, American Expeditionary Forces. Uh, du Bois would later describe it as the storm center concerning black combat troops. They had a very trying experience, uh, even though there were black officers in the division. All the commanding officers were white. Uh, most of them were incredibly racist, hostile to the very idea of black um, officers under their command. A uh, number of black officers were forced out of the division. Uh, it never uh, developed the type of cohesiveness and camaraderie that other uh, divisions in the American Expeditionary Forces had. It was plagued by rumors of rape, uh, this idea that black soldiers were guilty of a disproportionate number of sexual assaults uh, in France, which was completely false. I mean, kind of, so these kind of ideas that were so prevalent in the United States, especially in the South, right, about race, uh, specifically about uh, the nature uh, of black men, were transported 
overseas to France through the United States Army, right? So white supremacy was very transatlantic, uh, we might say, and transported by uh, the American Army. The experiences of the 92nd Division and black combat troops would have been much worse uh, if it were not for the service of black women. Uh, black women played a very important part in World War I. Uh, World War I represents a very important moment in terms of uh, the larger history of black women, uh, political and black women's political uh, activism, both within the United States as well as in France. Right? Again, thinking kind of transatlantically, uh, Catherine uh, Johnson and A.D. Hutton uh, were two of only three African-American YMCA workers right, who were responsible uh, with uh, providing uh, support Right, and resources to black troops. Uh, they were seen as heroes. Uh, and uh, undoubtedly, and the testimonies of black troops speak to this, right? their experiences would have been incredibly worse uh, if it were not for uh, the support that they provided. Uh, there were African American Red Cross nurses uh, who had to endure segregation as well, right, both overseas as well as uh, in the United States. Um, but this uh, speaks to a, a larger tradition um, of black women's uh, civic activism, right, taking advantage of different uh, organizations, specifically on the behalf of the race, but also specifically on the behalf of uh, black women, right, and also uh, serving in a number of different uh, capacities uh, domestically in YWCA hostess houses, uh, providing uh, uh, comfort kits, uh, things of that sort. Uh, but also uh, serving as important resources for the larger uh, domestic war effort. You also have a number of African American women who speak out against racism and racial injustice, like Ida B. Wells. Um, what I love about this picture is that she has a button which she created herself, which she produced herself, and you can't see it in the picture here, but it says, in memoriam to the Houston martyred soldiers. So she took it upon herself right, when other so-called leaders didn't want to, to hold, uh, to organize a protest right, against the persecution that the soldiers in the Houston riot uh, received by the War Department. Um, and it speaks to her personal conviction right, and fearlessness, uh, but also speaks to um, the fact that there were other black women uh, who were uh, willing to uh, risk their uh, safety uh, as well by speaking out against uh, the injustices of the time. Going back to the combat experience of black soldiers, uh, there was, as I said, uh, another black combat division, the 93rd Division. The 93rd Division was unique because it was made up largely of National Guard units uh, from Chicago, Washington, D.C., New York, uh, other uh, areas, saw extensive combat duty in France. And this was because they were actually embedded, they actually served with the French military. The American uh, Army didn't know what to do with this collection of black National Guard units, uh, so they gave them to the French. Pershing had promised the French a division of American soldiers and conveniently gave the 93rd Division over to the French because they had had their own experiences with uh, black troops uh, harking back to their colonial soldiers. But this actually turned out to be kind of a blessing in disguise for soldiers in the 93rd uh, Division uh, who uh, didn't have to endure the type of institutional uh, racism and hostility that their counterparts in the 92nd Division received, uh, and they also had the opportunity to serve on the front lines. Uh, they were highly uh, decorated and received widespread praise from their French comrades, um, many of whom actually preferred these black soldiers uh, over uh, the white soldiers uh, who they uh, interacted with. The most famous regiment of the 93rd Division was the 369th Infantry Regiment, which you may be familiar with, the Harlem Hellfighters. Uh, a name they received actually kind of at the tail end of the war. Uh, they referred to themselves as the Black Rattlers uh, uh, during the war. Uh, but they had a really, truly remarkable experience. Uh, 
uh, served for 191 consecutive days straight on the front lines without losing an inch of ground to the German army. Uh, they also had a slamming jazz band led by James Reese Europe, uh, arguably the most uh, famous uh, ragtime conductor in the United States. He was recruited by the white commanding officer of uh, the New York 15th uh, originally, which would become the 369th Infantry Regiment, to kind of drum up support for the regiment. But James was here said, I want to have a band. I'm not just going to you know, be here recruiting folks. Um, oh, and I also want to be an officer as well. Uh, so he recruited some of the best musicians from all over the country. He got some musicians from Puerto Rico. Uh, as well, and put together a remarkable uh, band, which would become famous uh, throughout France. Um, he and other African-American regimental bands were responsible for really ushering in the jazz age, for introducing France to this kind of wild, exotic music of um, uh, called jazz, uh, and were important kind of cultural conduits. Um, uh, also contributed to and the fetishization um, of black culture. That would become a hallmark of how uh, the French uh, saw African Americans uh, in particular. The 369th was also famous for the heroics of two of its soldiers, Henry Johnson and Needham Roberts, who on the night of May the 13th, 1918, routed a 24-man German raiding party. The, that picture doesn't really look like what the Western Front looked like, just, just so you know. <laughs> um, it was a little bit different. Um, but the, the story of Henry Johnson and Needham Roberts uh, was one of the most uh, significant of the war. Uh, Henry Johnson using a combination of grenades, his bolo knife, kind of these big kind of foot-long knives that soldiers uh, would carry and the butt of his rifle single-handedly killed four German soldiers and wounded uh, another dozen. Right? So the little penknife that's in this picture you know, was uh, far from the truth. Came to be known as the Battle of Henry Johnson. It became front page news uh, in uh, both white and black newspapers uh, throughout the country. Uh, they were the first two American soldiers to receive the French Croix de Guerre uh, with palm. And they were kind of celebrated as uh, racial symbols. Uh, Henry Johnson, we just uh, a couple of years ago, received uh, the Medal of Honor uh, posthumously, uh, certainly long overdue. Uh, but they became kind of the, the Christmas addicts, right? They became the, the Massachusetts 54th. They became these kind of important symbols of black heroism and sacrifice and were used by African Americans in the United States as examples right, um, of why African Americans should receive their rights at the end of the war. I mean, how can anyone deny that Johnson and Roberts uh, and other African Americans serving on the front lines were not only heroic, uh, but exemplified uh, the larger worthiness of African Americans for first class, first class citizenship at the end of the war? Obviously, it was not this easy. Memories of the 369th also competed with other memories of the black experience overseas, uh, which were largely negative. Majority of black soldiers, particularly those in the 92nd Division, as I mentioned before, had to endure uh, kind of horrific institutionalized racism targeted by white military officials. Black officers were labeled as worthless, inefficient, cowardly, untrustworthy. Uh, this is one of the commanders, white commanders um, of the American uh, Expeditionary Forces, General Robert Lee Bullard from Alabama. So you could probably imagine how he thought about black troops. Right? He wrote in his post-war memoir of the 92nd Division specifically that the Negro Division seems in a fair way to be a failure. Went on to state altogether, my memories of the 92nd Negro Division are a nightmare. If you need combat soldiers, and especially if you need them in a hurry, don't put your time upon Negroes. All right, so this was the larger view of white officers in the American Army. And this was how 
the history of black participation in the war was being framed. Right, immediately after the war and throughout the, uh, the, the early to mid-1920s when memoirs like Bullard's began to be published. Right? These were the type of stories that were being told of black soldiers. These, uh, this was the image that was being kind of instilled into um, uh, both the official history as well as into the popular memory of black participation uh, in the war. And I think it's contributed even today Right, to a larger assumption that African Americans didn't play an important part in World War I, right? that they were kind of tangential to the war effort, that they you know, really didn't make any significant contribution. Right? I mean, so we see how this type of characterization continues to inform how black soldiers are thought about even today. And this was simply not true. Right? Black soldiers made important contributions uh, to the war effort. But more importantly, even uh, immediately after the war, African Americans began to shape the history of their participation on their own terms. Black communities welcomed their soldiers home with large parades, festivities, homecoming events, ranging from small local gatherings to huge parades like that of the 369th returning uh, to New York, February of 1919, marching up uh, Fifth Avenue. Tens of thousands of New Yorkers came out uh, to witness uh, this event. Uh, the black press uh, certainly hailed the participation of black soldiers in the war as an unqualified uh, success. Uh, the Harlem Renaissance, um, the New Negro Renaissance, uh, which developed uh, in the post-war years, uh, a whole host of black novelists, playwrights, poets produced a range of different works which had black soldiers as central characters, again demonstrating their uh, importance. Black intellectuals attempted to write kind of the official history of black participation in the war, W.B. Du Bois uh, being one of the most significant people uh, in that effort. So we have this larger effort to create a communal memory uh, amongst African Americans in which their participation in the war was uh, both uh, successful uh, and would be passed down from generation to generation. Right? So the memory of black participation, uh, black service in the war was not forgotten. Right? It was not erased from history. Uh, it remained uh, very important. But uh, certainly uh, the memories that many black soldiers had were not uh, altogether positive. One black soldier uh, wrote after the war uh, about his disillusioning experience. And a quote here, we were treated like dogs. I mean, worse than German prisoners, I would die before I would undertake to go through what I have gone through. All right, so while you have many African Americans who are celebrating the service of black soldiers in the war, you have black veterans who are really struggling at times with kind of the trauma of their experience, right? both physically, Right? but also in terms of the trauma of racism that they had to endure. And this shaped the political tenor of the post-war period, how black soldiers saw themselves as returning home from one war and entering another. W.B. Du Bois famously penned in the May 1919 issue of The Crisis, we return, we return from fighting, we return fighting. Make way for democracy, we saved it in France, and by the great Jehovah, we will save it in the United States, or know the reason why. All right? Now, he was being literary here. But the reality was that African Americans were indeed returning to another war. And white Americans were ready to fight as well. You have a spike in lynching after the war. 76 African Americans lynched, both North and South. Race riots erupting all over the country. This is in Chicago, one of the most notorious uh, race riots. 38 people uh, killed. I love this picture. I mean, there's, there's like so much going on here, right? You have this black soldier, right, who is bold enough, right, to confront this white soldier, maybe a National Guardsman, would love to know what they were talking about. All right. I also want to know what this kid is thinking about too. Yeah. Right. <laughs> He's posing for, for the picture, styling. Right. 
Um, but, I mean, this was... Yeah, I mean, just the, the evocativeness uh, of this image and how we can see how, how these soldiers, how these returned soldiers kind of embody this new Negro, right? the spirit uh, of a new Negro uh, returned from war right? who was not going to stand for being abused. Right? So many African-American soldiers kind of translated their experiences, right? their disillusionment into different forms of post-war radicalism and activism right, in organizations like the Universal Negro Improvement Association, led uh, by Marcus Garvey, uh, other groups like the African Blood Brotherhood, uh, which was uh, more Marxist in orientation, uh, groups like the League for Democracy, which was specifically for black veterans. Right? So we see black veterans kind of serving as both symbols but actual participants in a whole range of different uh, political organizations uh, and movements that shaped uh, the New Negro um, movement more broadly. So what do we make of this history? Right, what do we make of the legacy of the war? Certainly by the late 1920s, racial conditions had shown no signs of improving. W.B. Du Bois wrote that the war was a scourge, an evil, a retrogression to barbarism, a waste, a wholesale murder. This idea that the war had not been worthwhile was incredibly powerful. The evidence was there. What had changed as a result of the war? You could certainly make the argument that things had gotten worse. And perhaps this was the case. But it was also undeniable that the war and black participation in the war marked a crucial moment in the history of black struggle for freedom and democracy in the United States. That without World War I, what we consider today to be the modern civil rights movement would not have existed. When we think about a long civil rights movement, World War I, in many ways, kind of is the crucial moment Right, when African Americans really latched on to this idea um, of democracy right, and used it to shape a movement that would continue to grow throughout the 20th century and into the 21st century. Now, historians often point to World War II as being that moment, right, kind of as being kind of the birth of the modern civil rights movement, but I would argue that World War I was equally, if not, more important. I point to examples like this guy, Charles Hamilton Houston. Charles Hamilton Houston was a soldier, an officer in World War I. He was commissioned at the Fort Des Moines uh, training camp, which I mentioned, served overseas in France, had a terrible experience in the war. Returned home deeply disillusioned. Right? He was actually almost lynched in France when a group of white officers were incensed by seeing him and a group of other black officers interacting with a group of French women. Returned home to Washington, D.C., where a race riot broke out. His father, who was an attorney, actually served as a defendant for some of the black people who were charged with false crimes during the Washington, D.C. race riot. So again, coming home, leaving one, one, one war, coming home to another. He said that he would never again be caught off guard without knowing what his rights were. He used that experience in the war to go to law school. Motivated him to go to law school, went to Harvard Law, and uh, eventually he would become one of the nation's leading civil rights attorneys. Uh, he would spearhead uh, the NAACP's legal efforts to dismantle Jim Crow segregation. He would serve as a mentor uh, to a generation of black uh, attorneys. Uh, he served as dean of the Howard University Law School. Thurgood Marshall was one of his star pupils. Uh, Thurgood Marshall, who would become the first uh, black Supreme Court uh, justice. He was one of the critical figures 
in the civil rights movement, right? And his experience in World War I was pivotal to that. So we owe a great deal to Charles Hamilton Houston. We owe a great deal to other uh, black soldiers, um, both famous and some forgotten, right? Who should occupy a central place in how we think about World War I 100 years later, right? How we commemorate the war, right? Just what type of stories we choose to tell, what type of individuals we choose to focus on, right? Their contributions on and off uh, the battlefield uh, are a critical part of the larger story of World War I. And it's essential to think about World War I and the black experience in the war so we can have more constructive, fruitful discussions about the meaning of our own democracy today. As I said, we are currently living through a extraordinary time, right? with the ideals of democracy being tested in profound ways. Since the founding of this country, the ideal of democracy has been contested, and race has been at the center of the struggles over the meaning of democracy. And that hasn't changed. And we are seeing the manifestations of that. We see how it's been expressed just in the past few years, right? whether it's in a place like Ferguson, Missouri, on election night, 2016, in Charlottesville, on football fields. How the ascendancy of white nationalism to the highest levels of our government, to the highest echelons of our democracy, says much about how we don't engage with history and the type of history that we choose to tell about this country's past. And our democracy has suffered as a result. The type of historical reckoning that is necessary to develop a truly inclusive and robust notion of democracy still has not happened. And that's why I believe World War I is so important, why the experiences of African American soldiers is important, why someone like W.B. Du Bois is so important, who spent his entire life Right, trying to get folks to understand just what democracy could be and why thinking, centering the experiences of black people and reckoning with history was essential to developing a truly inclusive notion of democracy. So black soldiers in World War I matter. They matter because we need to reckon with history. We need to recognize that African-American soldiers have been at the forefront of struggles for democracy throughout this, this country's history. African-American soldiers remind us that black lives have always mattered, will continue to matter. And they remind us that democracy has been something that African-Americans have not just kneeled for, but have been willing to die for as well. So I'll end there. Thanks. Time for questions. Time for questions. All right. I probably talk too much. It is. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Oh, great talk. I, um, oh, I, I love uh, all these uh, photographs. And I think you made a very um, compelling case for the importance of World War I and not just putting it in terms of World War II as you know, sure. serving and therefore demonstrating you know, the, that the right to citizenship and so on. Um, and you also brought out a lot of the complexity of this idea of democracy. And I wanna, I'm really struck. My question is about the wars. I am really struck. Um, by the sort of contrast or contradiction, if you like, between this incredibly clear-eyed and, in my view, absolutely correct view 
that it's an inter-imperialist war. Some of the imperialists have democracy at home as they subjugate colonial peoples abroad, and others, home rule is less democratic. But um, it's an inter-imperialist war, and to, to call it a war for democracy is already problematic, even apart from right. you know, racial, uh, hair and fault democracy in the US or right. elsewhere. I think Du Bois understood that so clearly, and at the same time, I don't want to, I don't know if this is fair, but there is something like, still let's, as a strategy, go with it yep. to get our rights, yep. to make the US more democratic. Um, but I, uh, I mean, we know that a lot of, that there was a, that World War I caused a tremendous rift among US left and progressive intellectuals. Absolutely. And, and who split down the middle with Dewey on one side and mm -hmm. Norman Thomas and, and Du Bois. Even the organization like, Mars, like the NAACP, right. which Du Bois was a part of. I mean, you have members of the NAACP leadership uh, who are this is what I wanted to hear unabashedly exactly. pacifist uh, and refuse to support the war, uh, who are you know, members of and, and some more you know, leaning uh, in terms of their support to the Socialist Party. Um, but then you have individuals like Du Bois, his good friend Joel Spingern, uh, who think that service in its various capacities will make a difference, right? Um, so yeah, so it was incredibly divisive. And, and I certainly don't want to give the impression that all African Americans supported the war, right? Because that, that certainly was not the case. I mean, you probably have the majority of African Americans, particularly in the South, who are largely apathetic uh, to the war effort, uh, certainly until they get drafted uh, and you know, see this kind of as a, as a personal uh, opportunity to demonstrate their citizenship, to get tangible benefits uh, from serving uh, in the military, right, as an opportunity. Um, but you have many African Americans who are flat out opposed to it, right? Part of the story of the Great Migration, especially during uh, the, uh, American participation in the war, is African Americans, you know, not responding to their draft calls, right? Uh, so that type of resistance. Uh, you certainly have uh, African Americans who are uh, part of the Socialist Party, like A. Philip Randolph and Chandler Owen. Uh, they get arrested. Um, just the the type of uh, suppression of uh, free speech um, uh, against uh, uh, groups uh, who were deemed radical uh, you know, certainly ensnared many uh, African Americans as well. So there were different levels uh, of resistance, right? I mean, so in some ways, Du Bois was uh, not entirely representative, right, uh, in that regard. Um, Thank you. But, but I do think, you know, going back to your, your, for, your first point, um, his interpretation of the war was, was spot on, right? And in some ways was so far ahead of its time in terms of, of his interpretation, right? And because, I mean, now we certainly uh, acknowledge how, you know, empire played such an important role uh, in uh, the origins um, of the war uh, and uh, kind of how, you know, the tensions uh, that were exacerbated uh, by you know, these de desires for, for territorial conquest and, and, and whatnot, you know, really uh, were, were at the core of the war uh, as well. Uh, so in that regard, I think we should, we should certainly give Du Bois a lot of credit. Yeah. Um, oh, it's always hard to call on people. Yeah, go ahead, sir, yeah. and then. You talked about the difference between World War I. You compared World War I and World War II. Um, I was thinking a little backwards. Um, was there a difference? between uh, African-American participation in the Spanish-American War mm -hmm. and World War I, mm -hmm. seeing this as a turning yep. point. And I'm, if I'm, remember, I'm guessing that the Spanish-American War maybe didn't have a draft. Um, and, and yeah, it was, uh, it was limited. I mean, certainly the duration of American participation right. in the war I mean, mitigated against. And Mass enlistment. Um, but and in how did the draft work in World War One? Okay. You know, because I'm assuming 
you know, there weren't um, some of these soldiers weren't didn't have the right to vote. No, well, as I said, African Americans throughout the South, I mean, were largely disenfranchised. Right? Uh, so it, it didn't. Right, right. So it didn't, you know, function kind of through the, the voting rolls, right? So in terms of the, the Spanish, uh, I got to throw Cuban in there, Spanish-Cuban-American War, right? Because Cuba had a, had a lot to do with that, that conflict. Um, uh, the uh, black soldiers uh, from the regular army, as I said, so-called Buffalo soldiers, uh, were, uh, played the largest role uh, in that conflict military. So the 9th and 10th Cavalry, the 24th and 25th, uh, infantry, uh, they were um, they were created uh, in the immediate aftermath of uh, the Civil War, right? And saw extensive duty uh, in Cuba, uh, also in uh, Puerto Rico, later in the Philippines. Uh, so their their participation was was very important. Uh, and again, thinking about what black soldiers symbolized in terms of fighting for the nation, uh, demonstrating the larger collective patriotism and, and citizenship of black people, the Buffalo Soldiers were incredibly important. Right? So they were harking back to during World War I as examples of what African American soldiers had done uh, in the past. Now what's significant about their experience is they were not allowed to serve in World War I at least not overseas. The War Department made the decision that they were not going to be sent to France, that they would remain in the United States, that they would remain uh, on uh, the, the Mexican border in the Southwest, that they would remain in the South Pacific. And the reason for that was they were some of the most seasoned and experienced soldiers in really the entire American army. And the threat that they could potentially pose uh, to, as I said, kind of the, the, the military racial hierarchy uh, was, was such that the army felt that it was best not to have them serve in France altogether. Right? So throughout the war, we see the military, the War Department, putting the race question ahead of military efficiency. Right? And it was, I mean, it was just one of many oxymorons, right? I mean, they would make the argument that this was in the best interest of the military, right? That segregation was the most efficient form of waging war, right? Of raising an army, right? But at the same time, you're sidelining your most effective soldiers, right? With the most experience, right? So the type of sacrifices that the War Department made on the behalf of white supremacy, right? Was constant throughout uh, the experiences of, of black soldiers. Right? Um, your second question about uh, the selective service system. So the selective service system was run locally. Right? So um, names uh, were uh, collected. Uh, well, actually, I, I take that back. There were calls uh, sent out to to local communities, right? And you were expected to to show up, right? on your, your designated day, right? um, and um, uh, African Americans were uh, included uh, within those draft calls. Um, they were uh, given uh, draft registration cards, all right, and they had to fill them out, uh, and the individuals in the local uh, They would actually record uh, the race of the individuals who submitted their cards. In the case of African Americans, they they tore off the corner of their their draft card. Right. So on its face, the draft was colorblind. There was no place on the registration card to indicate what your race was. But the local administrators of the draft, whenever a black person turned in their card, they ripped off the corner so they could tell who the Negroes were, right? Um, so that's how this, this system of segregation uh, really began uh, kind of at the, the level of the selective uh, service system. I have a question. Yeah, actually, um, and they're not related. Uh, one has to do with the uh, Double B campaign. Mm -hmm. um, and because what you were describing that you know, that's you know, associated with World War II, um, what you described is basically that in many ways. Sure. Um, you know, democracy, freedom abroad and at home. 
Um, and I'm wondering if you're thinking in those terms, um, you know, where this work is concerned or did you think in those terms? But my question really has to do with the Harlem Health Fathers. Um, because Francis and Imperial Power is embracing this particular brigade. But at the same time, right, uh, the situation with their own colonial troops is the antithesis of this, right? Um, and you have, you know, later uh, this interesting exchange between Ali and Locke and Rene Mahan, where they're comparing an opportunity, or opportunity, you know, this debate about how American soldiers are treated versus how mm -hmm. colonial conscripts are treated. And I'm wondering if you if you were thinking about, you know, those types of, they're not really contradictions, but they yeah. appear such. Yeah, yeah. So, let's see, where to start? That's such a, a good question. I mean, I think I, I want to maybe start by the, the image of, of France that gets developed as a result of the experiences of the 369th and other black soldiers, uh, particularly the 93rd Division, who were serving directly with the French. So this idea of, of French kind of colorblindness, of France being this haven of racial democracy, in many ways comes out of that experience, right? And the stories that black soldiers tell of their experiences, right? How they were welcomed into the homes of French families, right? How they were able to have sex with, with French women, right? How the, the French officers you know, praise them for their, their courage and their, their heroism, right? Oftentimes juxtaposing that to uh, their, their colonial troops. I think part of that mythology comes from just how brilliantly racist the American army was, right? How these soldiers are, they're not experiencing racial egalitarianism, so to speak, right? They're experiencing a form of acceptance and a different type of racial thinking that they hadn't been exposed to, right? In juxtaposition to the type of just kind of horrific, you know, blatant, you know, racism and hostility that they were exposed to by their own American, you know, comrades, right? Their white American uh, comrades. So. Uh, in some ways, they were they were kind of deluded. I mean, white white supremacy transported from the United States to France kind of had had the effect of making France look so much better in the eyes of, of black troops and of other African Americans uh, as well. Right? Because as I said, I think uh, sure, sure, absolutely. All right. So, uh, so I think that's a, a really uh, kind of important uh, part of that. Um, but the, the experiences of uh, of African colonials is, is really important, right? Because it does kind of serve as this kind of juxtaposition, right? Um, on the one hand, and the French play into this uh, as well. On the one hand, you have, uh, you know, the the two other Senegalese. So I can go all the way, all the way back to the end of my my PowerPoint. Who are seen as uncivilized? savage, who had no understanding of modern warfare, who can't be controlled, right? And so you see in the black press, and even in some of the testimonies of, of black soldiers, how they're talking, even Du Bois, he plays into this as well, right? How the Senegalese would charge into the German lines without any thinking for their own safety or welfare. Right? That all they would be carrying was their, their quote unquote native weapons. Right? And at the end of the charge, they'd all be dead. Right? So kind of this blind loyalty and sacrifice right, to, to the French Empire. Juxtapose that to African American troops, right, who were being trained in kind of the sophistication of modern warfare who knew how to man machine guns, you know, who mastered proper formations and battlefield movements and tactics, right? So this idea of African-American soldiers as being on a higher level of civilization, 
right, and kind of racial development than their African counterparts was something that was kind of prevalent throughout the war and the post-war period as well. Um, and I think it really says a lot about how diaspora consciousness was kind of forged, right? Practice, to use Brent Edwards' uh, terminology, kind of in uh, the crucible of the war, right? Where you have these uh, truly remarkable moments of engagement between black soldiers, you know, from uh, Africa and black soldiers from the United States, right? Similar to the type of interactions that would happen after the war, um, you know, between black intellectuals and, and, and writers, right? Um, you know, where they're learning about each other's culture and experiences and, and dialoguing about the potential of, of solidarity, right, in, in all these different forms. Right? But you also have these kind of profound moments of, of miscommunication and the inability to, to dialogue, right, and the lack of translation that, that's taking place, um, you know, where the stereotypes that were so pervasive in the French colonial project were also very prevalent in the black imagination as well. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that. Gabriel has a question. Yeah. Um, so I found it interesting how um, you mentioned Woodrow Wilson's right work at the beginning of, of, of the presentation. And right before World War One, he regularly would talk about making the world safe for democracy. Well, those statements have kind of been echoed throughout the following years. Um, during the Vietnam War, during, during the Korean War, we would hear the leaders saying, we're doing this to make America safe for democracy. Even nowadays, when we go to war, the rallying call is, let's make the world safe for democracy. Right. And most of these conflicts occur roughly in similar times as volatile states within the US, especially in terms of race, uh, race relations. So uh, my question is, do you think that there's any correlation between these two phenomena? Um, that these leaders are saying, let's make the world safe for democracy to kind of draw attention away from the lack of democracy in our country. Yes. <laughs> to answer your question, yes, I think you're, you're, you're right on the money. And especially in how you identify moments of warfare and the company rhetoric uh, that the United States and its leaders espouse to justify American involvement in different conflicts uh, with racial insurgency right, and racial tensions more broadly, right? How war exacerbates, kind of brings to the forefront those tensions and, and inconsistencies, hypocrisies, right, of the American democratic experiment. I mean, in some ways we can we can trace the arc of the black freedom struggle through moments of warfare, right? I mean, we see how, I mean, certainly during the American, um, excuse me, the, the Civil War, right? Uh, you know, in terms of the aftermath, reconstruction, 1314, 15th uh, Amendments, I mean, how that becomes, you know, kind of a, a critical starting points for the modern black freedom struggle. No, I made the case for World War One and World War II uh, was mentioned. Um, Vietnam War, right? the Civil Rights Movement, Black Power Movement. Uh, I mean, we can even think about it in, in, our, in our current context today. Right? Uh, what does it mean to talk about a war on terror? Right? For example, when black people are being terrorized you know, in, in various ways. Um, you know, even, even today. Uh, so yeah, so I think the experiences of, of African Americans during times of war and the specific experiences of black soldiers has really been central to exposing the type of, of inconsistencies and contradictions that you're very astutely uh, pointing out to. If you're not too tired, I have a couple of questions. Uh, one is, uh, you mentioned that uh, the first one is about socialism among African Americans. Uh, in Europe, socialists who started out being pacifists and against World War I, then put nationalism before pacifism, and that the only 
Socialist Party that, that went against that was the Italian Socialist Party, or the main pacifist party. So what kind of discussions do you have among African-American socialists at this point? Yeah. Uh, do, uh, do they end up going into the nationalist line and saying, well, you know, we are pacifists, socialism is pacifist, but we are Americans and into the war? Or mm -hmm. is the majority staying with a basic principle within socialism? That's my first question. The second question is, how different is the treatment of Latinos compared to African Americans? I mean, 98, you have the Jones Act for Puerto Rico, so I know nothing about it. So uh, it's just curiosity on my part. Okay. So your first question, about, I'll go back to Ethel Randolph and Chandler. You have a small number of African Americans who are in the American Socialist Party uh, who consider themselves hardcore socialists. Uh, so, uh, Avril Randolph, again, when we think about the modern civil rights movement, Avril Randolph is like critical, right? The March on Washington, 1963, um, I'm seen as kind of the high point in the civil rights movement, that's Avril Randolph, right? That's his idea, that he originates in World War II, but he gets his political start, his political consciousness really begins to come of age during World War I, right? So he was around for, for that long. Uh, he was editor well, co-editor with Chandler Owen of the Messenger uh, magazine, which was considered to be the most radical Negro newspaper. Mm -hmm. And this is the Justice Department, um, you know, viewing the Messenger as a threat to national security, uh, essentially. Uh, so he was investigated, um, you know, from, from the start. Uh, he was uh, briefly imprisoned uh, for, uh, violating the, um, the Espionage uh, Act. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so you, so you have some uh, African American socialists who refuse to support the war under any circumstances, right? Uh, who see it as a, you know, war for, for, for the capitalists, I and mean, and African Americans, um, you know, have no, have nothing to gain, right? Um, so, um, so there's there's that in, in, in important story. Uh, see, in terms of uh, Latino soldiers, uh, again, I think you have to kind of disaggregate uh, the different groups that you're you're talking about. Uh, so, for uh, example, Puerto Ricans, uh, oftentimes they were uh, included uh, or they were uh, drafted uh, into African American uh, regiments because. Uh, many were, were seen as black. I mentioned uh, the 369th in James Rios, uh, Europe, so you have Puerto Rican soldiers serving in the 369th, and also uh, Puerto Rican serving as, uh, as laborers uh, in, in Puerto Rico. So race plays a, a, an important role in that regard. Um, the experiences of Mexican American soldiers, however, uh, they were seen as white oftentimes, mm -hmm. right? So they were drafted into to white uh, units uh, and, and divisions, and would have you know kind of remarkably different uh, experience, and especially those you know from uh, from Texas, the Southwest, uh, other places. Um, so yeah, so just how race was kind of defined within the context of the war, and how uh, different uh, Latino soldiers kind of fit along um, you know, that still very kind of dichotomized racial spectrum, right? Was Oh, of course. I mean, I talked to you. Well, you we can really stay really here for a long I know time, but I'm going to tell you. This is an easy one for okay. us. Maybe not. Um, I mean, this is such an amazing work. It was wonderful to hear you speak about it. I can't wait to read it. I'm just wondering how long you're finding this. What surprised you? Mm -hmm. Oh, let's see. What surprised me? Well, the, the diaspora story was really important. And, and, and surprising, and really spoke to some of my perhaps naive assumptions. I mean, I think I went into looking at the experiences of African American soldiers in France and their potential interactions with African soldiers as being these kind of moments of Pan-African unity, right? 
that okay in the trenches, here's Pan-Africanism, you know, in action. And it was it was much different. Right? I mean you have African American soldiers who are you know, not able to communicate with, with and it makes perfect sense, right? Um, but how they're, as I said before, kind of articulating some of the same stereotypes, uh, you know, that that white Americans that you know the colonial powers had in Africa was was really kind of eye opening, right? Um, so I found that to be interesting. The number of soldiers who, while expressing disillusionment and disappointment with their experiences, also said that they would serve again. That, that had to remind me that we're, we're talking about American citizens, right? We're talking about individuals who recognized the power of serving in the military of wearing the uniform of the United States. And what that did on you know, kind of a, a, a deep, personal, almost existential level, right? How that was such a transformative experience in so many different ways, right? So certainly not discounting you know, the brutality of, of American racism, right? But not giving it a completely totalizing effect, if that makes sense, right? That it didn't obliterate how these individuals saw themselves right, as, as Americans and what they were able to reap from their experiences, right? In terms of a broadened political or racial consciousness, in terms of tangible benefits, right? Being able to, to get that $30 a month, right, of serving in, in the military, right, as meager as that might sound, right, being able to get two or three meals a day. How much more? Being able white, to learn how to read. How much more were the white soldiers paid? What's the difference in pay? Well, it, it varied uh, according to rank, right? I mean, but so if you could say. On the same rank? Well, I mean, Certainly, I mean, there were problems with black soldiers being properly compensated, especially in terms of veterans' benefits um, after the war, right? Um, but, you know, I mean, they, they, they did get something out of it, right? And I think those, 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 those that's important to, to remember. Mm -hmm. and, and coming across you know, some of these um, kind of post-war memoirs, uh, and, and surveys that some states conducted with, with veterans, I mean, where you have you know, the soldiers saying that, you know, if I was drafted again, would I respond to my call? Yes, I would. Yeah. Well, thank you very much.